A February 2022 study published by the Pew Research Center found that Americans' trust in scientists and other groups declined between November 2020 and December 2021. The percentage of Americans who express, quote, a great deal of confidence in medical scientists to act in the best interest of the public dropped from 40 percent to 29 percent, and those expressing, quote, not too much to no confidence at all rose from 14 percent to 22 percent. I am Dr. John Padfield, and this is Business Reform, where I discuss issues at the intersection of business, technology, and society. In previous videos, I have discussed a couple of reasons for that decline. My video entitled Corrupted Science discussed several peer-reviewed scientific and medical journals that had to pull thousands of articles because of unethical authors and peer reviewers rigging the peer review process. And my video entitled When Science and Religion Trade Places discussed the trend over the past few years to accept the opinions of experts in place of following the scientific method. I have placed these videos in a playlist at the end of this video. This video deals with another problem in science that is causing a loss of confidence in science and scientists. It is called the replication crisis, and it has been written about some, but not in many mainstream media outlets. A quick Google search found articles about the replication crisis in Psychology Today, the American Psychological Association, Nature.com, the Atlantic, and Vox. However, there has not been much discussion of the replication crisis in the mainstream media, or as I sometimes refer to it, the media that is brought to you by Pfizer. So there is a good chance that most people are completely unfamiliar with what is going on and why it is so important. One of the hallmarks of legitimate science is that it can be replicated. If a researcher conducts a well-designed and well-controlled experiment, then publishes the details of their methodology and their results, another researcher should be able to repeat that experiment exactly as the first person did and get the same or at least very similar results. However, if the second researcher is unable to reproduce the results, that raises serious questions about the original research. It may mean that there is some variable that the first researcher didn't think was important, so they didn't attempt to control it or even document that variable. Then when the experiment is repeated, that variable is different and that produces different results. Or it may mean that the results of the original experiment were actually due to random chance rather than some new scientific principle or phenomenon. Or in the worst case scenario, it may mean that the first researcher falsified or exaggerated their results. Let me be clear, though. The inability to replicate results of an experiment does not automatically mean somebody falsified or exaggerated their results. There are other explanations. However, it does mean that the first research is now suspect until some explanation can be offered to explain why the results could not be replicated. So what percentage of peer-reviewed research can be replicated? In 2013, Brian Nosek and Jeffrey Spies founded an organization called the Center for Open Science with a mission to, quote, increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research. Their first project involved recruiting other scientists to crowdsource a collaboration to pick 100 studies from three major psychology journals and then repeat the research in those articles to see if they could replicate the results. In 2015, they completed their project and published their first report entitled The Reproducibility Project Psychology. And what did the study find? Quoting directly from the Reproducibility Project, quote, Reproducibility is a defining feature of science, but the extent to which it characterizes current research is unknown. We conducted replications of 100 experimental and correlational studies published in three psychology journals using high-powered designs and original materials when available. Replication effects were half the magnitude of the original effects, representing a substantial decline. 97% of the original studies had statistically significant results. 36% of the replications had statistically significant results. I have put a link to that study in the description of this video so you can read the entire study if you would like to do so. But let me read that last statement one more time. 
97 out of 100 of the original papers had statistically significant results. That does not surprise me in the least, because it is rare for a paper without statistically significant results to be published. Let me take just a moment to explain what statistically significant means. I could conduct an experiment where I take 200 high school freshmen and randomly put them into one of two groups. I could give the first group bacon and eggs for breakfast, and I could give the second group a bowl of cereal for breakfast. An hour later, all 200 students could take the same math exam. Imagine I calculate the average score for both groups, and I find the average score of those who ate bacon and eggs was 78.3%, and the average score of those who ate cereal was only 77.8%. There is a difference between the two groups of 0.05%. So can I conclude that eating bacon and eggs makes students perform better on test? Probably no. Even though there is a difference between the two groups, that difference is very small and it is probably not statistically significant, which means that that difference could probably just be the result of random chance. Now imagine the same scenario, but in this case, when I calculate the average of the two groups, the group who ate bacon and eggs had an average score of 98%, and those who ate a bowl of cereal had an average of 62%. In this case, the difference would be 36%. This difference is well beyond what random chance could account for, and it would be strong evidence that what a person eats for breakfast will have an impact on how they perform on a math exam. There is a formula for calculating how big a difference has to be in order to be considered statistically significant. I cover that formula in a graduate statistics course that I teach, but it is well beyond the scope of this video. The point is that studies that do not show a statistically significant difference rarely get published. When the Center for Open Science replicated 97 peer-reviewed published psychology research papers that had statistically significant results, they only found statistically significant results in 36 of those experiments. That is a 37% rate of replication. In other words, the Center for Open Science failed to obtain the same results as the published research in 63% of those 97 studies. The rate at which peer-reviewed papers can be replicated probably very significantly by discipline. So the next project started by the Center for Open Science was called the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology. In that study, 50 replication experiments from 23 peer-reviewed papers related to cancer biology were completed. Many of those experiments were multi-part experiments, so a total of 158 effects were attempted to be replicated. What the researchers found was the size of the effects in the replicated experiments averaged 85% smaller than the effect reported in the original research paper. As always, I have put a link to this study in the description of this video as well. I will close this video with a quote from the abstract of the Reproducibility Project. Reproducibility is a defining feature of science. However, because of strong incentives for innovation and weak incentives for confirmation, direct replication is rarely practiced or published. Whatever the result, a better understanding of reproducibility will ultimately improve confidence in scientific method and findings. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and be sure to check out some of my other videos. Thank you for watching.